so this talk was originally uh, a lot longer because uh, it turns out that the Swift ABI is freaking enormous. Uh, and so the title exploit really did fit at the time. For right now, I'm really just trying to go for more of a very broad overview of a lot of core concepts and just really introduce you to what Swift is actually doing at runtime when you are doing like a lot of common things that you are actually doing. And, and actually, I, I do want to try to convince you today that Swift is not necessarily a static language. So with that, we do have like a lot of information to cover still. Like we're going to try to work our way across a lot of parts of the runtime. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of fun stuff. We're going to end with like a call to arms about how we need more reflection primitives and we need more people that are interested in reflection primitives. Um, we also, you know, have to stumble through a bunch of hairy stuff, like we have to talk a little bit about type layout and metadata layout, and we have to talk about calling conventions and things like that. But it's going to be very brief. It's not going to be like, you know, I'm not going to actually go tell you how the, like, there used to be assembly in this talk. There's no more assembly in this talk. Um, but, you know, we are actually going to talk about, you know, like reflection, uh, type layouts, calling conventions, things like that. Okay, but we're also going to approach this more from a, you know, I'm a compiler engineer. It's, we're going to approach this from a Swift user. Because each one of these topics is its own little rabbit hole, and we can jump down them for an hour and a half, but you all need to go, you know, I, I'd like to catch a drink with some of you later, so, you know. Uh, and the, uh, there's going to be a lot of code. It's not necessarily going to be all Swift. If there's no more assembly, there will still be C++, and there will be a little bit of C, but it's going to be pseudocode. So I just want to say, all the code in this talk has no semantic value. It is purely illustrative. You don't need to read it. You don't need to understand it. We are here to just get the core concepts down and that you know, pseudocode happens to be the best way to express these things. All right, so with that out of the way, let's discuss where we're going and how we're gonna get there. So we're gonna begin by discussing code, data, and ABI. Next, we'll dive into Swift runtime processes, including the public, public ABI and how the compiler uses that ABI to implement the dynamic parts of Swift. Uh, that'll tee into a discussion of generics, it'll be very short. Uh, we'll finish with uh, layouts of runtime metadata and how we as Swift users can take advantage of that. So we're gonna start with code, data, and ABI. So evolution is a remarkably hairy subject. Things grow and change and they adapt and requirements change constantly, internally, externally, in biology and in software. There's a large amount of value in looking backwards though because large systems don't evolve wholesale. Little parts get replaced and upgraded as needed, and certain libraries might depend on newer features but still need to interoperate backwards with old features. A common way that this arises in human-centric systems is contract law. Excuse me. Skip all this crap. Now, this isn't a talk about contract law, don't get me wrong. We don't have nearly enough time for that. But if we step back and think about what a contract is, it's a set of terms and conditions that describes a good, a service, some kind of value to be exchanged between two parties subject to some kind of constraints like time and money and all these things. And we, once again, we can find these parallels in software systems. So an ABI for us today is precisely that. It is a set of guarantees that are made to you about the format of data, which runtime entry points are available and will remain available to the end of time, calling conventions, all of that hairy stuff that you usually don't have to think about when you're passing data around. Now, this doesn't mean that Swift isn't allowed to change how those services are rendered to you in the future. And bear in mind that stability in ABI is not a universal concept. It's entirely possible, and it's a really good thing that a new platform, uh, a new architecture, a new operating system, all of these, they can receive distinct ABIs. This allows Swift the freedom to continue to evolve and spread out and do what is right and efficient on a case-by-case -case basis. Because choosing the right abstractions is, is incredibly important. A, a case study of this is the first revision of the Objective-C uh, ABI, which, which Objective-C really didn't have versions at the time, 
uh, I guess it's sort of like the post next Apple slide up until like the introduction of the iPhone and 64 bit uh, Mac. Um, and I'm sorry for all this, the, the C++ programmers in the room, you're actually still dealing with this problem today, and, and it is the fragile base class problem. So let's imagine a simplified view of an Objective-C object, and, and our simplified view is just it's gonna be a block. There's a little block of storage, and it's got, some, it's got all the space that we need for all of our properties, and it's got a superclass pointer. So you know, we're, we're just gonna build this chain we're sort of gonna imagine that like the, the, the hierarchy sort of starts with you know, our, our, our label and it's gonna go up to the next super view like that. And so if we were to actually implement Objective-C this way, this problem actually goes away. It turns out this is not how it works. This is actually how the world works. Uh, your objects are sort of stacked and, and the superclass's properties are nestled inside of the subclass. And so the object kind of grows from top to bottom, which is to say most derived label first or la labels properties at the end, and uh, all the way up to uh, most generic, so NS object is somewhere at the top. And uh, uh, library evolution really throws a wrench in this problem. Uh, and it's really not obvious at first glance, but uh, let's sort of evolve the problem. Suppose that we own the label class, and hypothetical third party, perhaps a fruit company, owns the view class, they would like to evolve their API, possibly by adding an extra property, say like a mask view. And we would like to, re, uh, to relink against their SDK without necessarily recompiling our app. Well, here's the problem. Suppose that we try to do that, well, we're gonna collide, right? Because we're gonna try to insert an extra property underneath the view part of the block, but the label part hasn't been recompiled to know that the view has changed. So they're essentially sharing storage and your app breaks and the horrible things happen. And we, we think of this as sort of an innocuous change, right? Like the, you should be able to add properties to frameworks. Like this, this is like just a basic fact of life. But Objective-C then and C++ now do not guarantee binary compatibility for what you and I think of as these kinds of innocuous changes. Well, there is a solution to this, and for the visual spatial among you, the solution is, is what you were thinking of. We're just going to sort of, the runtime will take a look at all the different sizes of all the objects that are loaded, and it will dynamically slide uh, subclasses, uh, IVAR offsets, down below uh, where, where they need to be and sort of line everything back up for us. Um, so all this to say like, designing an ABI that's both flexible enough to accommodate evolution like this and also efficient is a really, really hard problem. Like it's something that very few languages have actually attempted and even fewer have succeeded. Like, you know, C++, uh, the GCC folks have gone through, I don't know how many different ABIs before they finally settled on the one that they're actually using. Like, it's, it's really incredible that we've gotten here. Like, this is a tremendous amount of work that has gone into stabilizing this ABI. And, and we're all the beneficiaries of, of that kind of work, and I, it's, it's just incredible. Um, but, you know, we gotta move forward here. So, if you'll excuse the return to contract law metaphors, let's have a peek at the goods and services that Swift guarantees and we'll start by discussing the runtime. So it might be surprising to hear that Swift actually has a runtime, or you know, one that's more than Objective-C's runtime. After all, you know, Swift is a static language, they say. It's got a strong static type system. Uh, we have a load-bearing NS invocation in our Objective-C code. We can't migrate to Swift. Uh, the, the big secret among all of us language designers is that like dynamic and static are not actually like hard qualia. Like, they're really a sliding scale, and you don't really see too many pure static systems at all. Like, there is some runtime component involved in most systems, and Swift actually has a very significant runtime. Um, so when I say, like, Swift is a dynamic language, I, I actually do want this to stick, and I feel the best way to convey that rhetorically is with an argument by iChart. Uh, this is the public surface of the Swift runtime API. Uh, this is 200-ish entry points 
And they do everything from runtime cast, reference counting, there's like two numerics functions in there, there's like tracing functions in the back half of this list, there's object allocation functions for like errors and all that, we'll get to all that. So what I've omitted from this slide is the Objective-C runtime, which has 112 public entry points, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with importing the fun time and using it like that. So depending on how you look at it, Swift has anywhere from 200 to 300 public runtime entry points. And uh, unlike the Objective-C API, uh, most of those entry points, they aren't really that much to sneeze at. Like, we have a lot of functions, but they all kind of, you know, you can kind of cluster them. And I'm, I'm gonna, you know, cover two big clusters of, of APIs here. Um, so a lot of the runtime is taken up by specializations of the reference counting functions. Uh, so in order to see why, let's take a look at what kind of object references that the Swift runtime has to deal with. So these are the kinds of objects that Swift knows how to reason about natively, as in the compiler knows how to emit the right code to make sure that everything always works out. So we have native Objective-C block and unknown. So native refers to Swift native, and it's the default scheme for objects that have a pure Swift inheritance chain. So native Swift objects have, have a slightly different runtime layout than Objective-C, uh, and uh, there actually is a separate base class called Swift Object, which is completely invisible to all of you, which acts as the root class in that case. Uh, so we have the specialized Swift Retain, Swift Release. We also have uh, aggregate versions of those, so Swift Retain N, Swift Release. Uh, I believe there's an N for that. Um, there's also highly specialized versions, so like there's, there's weak, unowned, um, and uh, unmanaged references as well, and we can, these all have separate retain counts, or, or separate reference counts. Uh, in, in a header uh, in that native object. Uh, Swift also supports Objective-C reference counting, of course, so we uh, can emit proper uh, uh, Objective-C retain and Objective-C release calls uh, when necessary. Uh, for blocks, we also manage those. We have block copy and block release. And finally, we have this notion of like an unknown object. And the idea is that there are certain situations where all of our static information sort of fails us because we can't sort of throw an object into one of these categories. Or perhaps you're doing something especially dynamic, like you're casting an object to another object. Uh, you're like bridging through to some, you know, class that you've inexplic inexplicably figured out a way to write. Um, <laughs> the runtime has a, it, it's like unknown is basically just try each one of these in turn. Like there's bits that it can test to see like, is this actually a native Swift object? Is this an Objective-C object? Whatever. And it'll do, it'll try to do the right thing. And if it falls back to, to Objective-C if all else fails. Um, so there's two additional schemas here, which I think are really uh, neat to highlight here. So a bridge object is uh, an optimization intended entirely for the standard library, although this is a talk about evil, so you are perfectly allowed to do this. There are public entry points in the runtime if you want to build your own tag pointers. Please, God, don't build your own tag pointers. Um, <laughs> the idea is that an object that supports, uh, it's an object that supports both Swift and Objective-C reference counts. And this is critical for performance when you're talking about uh, array, dictionary, and set, because all of those can be bridged back and forth between Objective-C. And there's actually a little tag bit that we got from Foundation that uh, they used to check to see like, is this a Swift object and do we actually, or, or not, and could, do we need to do Objective-C reference counting on it? Um, so this involves tag pointers, and if you're not familiar with tag pointers, it's literally just like, uh, there's a guaranteed set of zeros in any pointer value if you look at it uh, uh, because of alignment restrictions on, on platforms. And so you can actually use those bits if you want to. Uh, <laughs> and so there's actually a function in, in the standard library, which for some reason is public, I have no idea why it's public, that will do this. You can hand it an object pointer and you can hand it bits and it will mangle the bits into the lower part of the pointer. Okay, the last one is error. This is how uh, the, um, like all typed errors work in Swift. So the idea is that errors are transparently objects. So we will allocate an object uh, like if you throw an error, we'll allocate an error object, and it turns out that like it's critically important for both, you know, sort of the aesthetics of the API, and you know it's just a good thing to interoperate with Foundation. So it's actually layout compatible with CF error. Like you can cast a CF error to a Swift error if you wanted to, 
uh, it, it's, we, we do this, it's bizarre. Um, but like, it works, and it has all the, all the accessors work, you can like send messages to it, you can like reference count it like an Objective-C object if you want to. Um, to maintain encapsulation of that API, it has its own allocation and destruction functions, which are also in the ABI, which is that little box on the right if you actually go back and, uh, and go read the eye chart. Um, okay, so these are all the kinds of object references that Swift supports, uh, but there's more than just classes, right? So if we return to the table, we can section off just this enormous chunk on the right. Uh, and these are all functions that manipulate values at runtime. And they aid in both runtime abstractions and they actually help implement Swift's generic system. And, and that's the topic that we're headed for next. So it's runtime polymorphism. A powerful generic system sits at the heart of Swift and it is my favorite feature because I work on type checkers all day. Types and functions are allowed to, yeah, I like that too. Types and functions are allowed to depend on generic parameters, which are in turn allowed to be constrained by protocols and classes. So to support all of these features, Swift needs to have a way to abstract over a broad variety of data values, whether they're heap objects or structs or enums or functions or whatever. Like you should be able to like cast a function to any if you want to. Traditionally, there are two schools of thought. Either you like homogenize the values or you make the operations homogenous. And so what I mean by that is that like, if you want to homogenize the values, you can erase all the generics. And this is exactly what Objective-C does. Like, Objective-C generics are a lie. They, they don't exist, you can't even query them at runtime. They don't, they don't exist. Um, this is also how Java and Haskell and OCaml all, all do. They all erase, uh, and they pass around like common currency types. And so like in Objective-C, the, the common currency type is ID. Uh, and so like when you have a selector like this, like contains object, you naturally get id uh, for the self value, for the NS array value, uh, you get a, a little selector a CMD, and then you get the actual argument value, and then it returns a, a bool. Um, but the, if you're in Java though, like, you know, boxing is this huge like performance drain, because like you passing around, you, you accidentally capitalize the word integer, and then suddenly like you're, you're allocating an object every time you're passing around a number. Um, so, you know, it's not optimal. There, there's another strategy. So we can aggressively specialize generic functions instead. And this is what C++ does. Like, C++ doesn't actually really have a generic system either. They just use templates as this, like, stamp. And it's just like, you know, it's a, it's a stamp that's like Turing complete, but it's a stamp. And it just, like, stamps out all these little implementations for you, uh, one after another, depending on the specializations that you have available here. And the, the specialization is just like, you know, uh, you know, you want a list of characters or a list of classes or a list of floats, this kind of things. Uh, this is great for raw runtime performance because like once you specialize and you put like a float in that node or something, like compiler can go nuts. Uh, it's a problem if you're dealing with like code size because you can imagine you specialize a lot and you have to emit a new function every time. Um, there are optimizations that can fix this. Not all of them work as well as you think they do. Um, but like, you know, macros on steroids are, are you know, an approach. Uh, Rust has a sort of a, a slightly better answer to this. Uh, they do aggressively specialize as well, but it's not, it's not quite um, template instantiations. They're a little smarter. Um, so there are certainly more subtle benefits and drawbacks to all of these approaches. And it's, it's also true that neither of these approaches fully captures how Swift generic system actually works. Swift carves a third path, statically checked runtime polymorphism. In a way, Swift takes a centrist approach. Because values are represented and passed efficiently, there's no boxing. Generic code is also unspecialized by default. So this means that we get the best of both worlds. We have a code size saving at the expense of some speed. We also get this nice sort of erasure style, simple runtime polymorphism. So we literally, we do this by literally compiling and generics as values. And we call these archetypes. So an archetype is a runtime representation of a type and it contains all the information you need to interact with that type. When a generic Swift function is compiled, the generic parameters, the archetypes, are passed as values. If the archetype is constrained by a protocol, another runtime structure is passed as well, those are called witness tables, 
There was a section on those, I cut it. It's too long. We will forgo all of that. There's an LVM talk you can go watch by uh, uh, John McCall, uh, and I believe Slava Pestov. Uh, it's incredible, it's up on YouTube. Um, archetype values are, it's just a table of function pointers. Like it's super simple. Um, and it contains everything. Like it tells you how to copy it, tells you how to destroy it, how to initialize it. There's a special operation that we have called take, uh, where you can like knock a value out and steal its brains if you want to. Um, there's runtime entry points to dynamically construct structs and enums uh, and initialize everything, all based around manipulating these kinds of values. So here's what it, like the behind the scenes, this is what's happening. This is exactly what I'd uh, looks like if you actually go and, and, and you dig out its representation. Like we will convert that parameter into, you know, it's generic, we actually don't know what size it is, we're gonna pass it as a reference. We're gonna pass the archetype as a value. That's T, it's a value, it's a pointer. And then we have this like return buffer because we, you know, we can't, we don't know how big T is either. Uh, so we're gonna also take it as a reference. And then we're gonna do the obvious thing. We're gonna use T's table of function pointers to implement a generic function. So there's a copy function pointer. We're gonna like take X, we're gonna copy it, and we're gonna get a new value, and we're gonna store it into the return buffer. And then we're gonna destroy it. And that's it. That's how you implement IDE. So these are the required witnesses that you need, uh, and they are, like I said, there's called it's a value witness table, which is to say it's a table that is implemented by values that witnesses these operations. Um, so, you know, uh, one thing to notice about this is that none of this is actually like reflectable data, right? Like this is not the name of the class or like the field offsets or anything like that. So for that, we actually need to look more broadly at other kinds of type metadata. Um, so we're gonna talk about runtime metadata. So if you go poking around the Swift project, there's this header, and it's conveniently called metadata.h, and in it are the C++ definitions that correspond directly to the runtime representations of metadata values. And this is like really neat, uh, assuming you can like stomach templates. So like with a little bit of mental effort and like a whole lot of pointer math, in theory, we should be able to like read the header and translate all of this into like a super simple metadata reader and then all we gotta do is like worry about like reading a Swift file and we just pull out these relevant sections and you know, we, we, we do all this work and we run the reader and then it, it breaks. It crashes. Uh, it's just not enough to do the obvious thing. And it's like, there's actually a really good reason why. Uh, so to explain it, I have to tell you what happens to you know, set up a Swift process. Um, so on platforms like Mac OS and Linux, where ASLR, address space layout randomization, uh, is pervasive, so too is the idea of position independent code. So the idea is that like the operating system, if it were to load you at a static offset every single time, then an attacker could potentially anticipate that and start reading your memory and steal everything. So instead the operating system can choose to relocate binaries at random addresses so that it's at least a little bit more difficult. You actually do have to go search. Um, position independent code, uh, grew like actually not as a result of address space layout randomization is actually an idea from like the 1970s but like uh, the idea is that it, it, it's code that's tolerant to this kind of movement um, so because uh, so so the idea that is that like when you actually launch the application and you actually go to load it goes to load its libraries the linker takes a look and it needs to position that library in memory and so it actually slides the library to its final address but this sliding action has an unfortunate side effect because when we slide all the pointers, all the global pointers in a framework, and there's a lot of them because we emit all this metadata, like we dirty a lot of memory in the process. And you know, given that you have two instances, because you know, if you're loading foundation, you're loading foundation a lot. You're loading foundation basically every time you're spinning up a, a user land process. Like if that were written in Swift, like 
and, and we were using the scheme, like we'd be dirtying, like we, the OS couldn't like reliably share those pages. It couldn't guarantee that the memory that we've dirtied is gonna be the same every single time because it doesn't know what we're doing. So it actually would just create multiple copies of the library and we just keep sliding them into different parts of memory. Um, but I use the word slide for a reason. To kind of jog your memory here, if you, if you think back to the beginning of the talk. Because the solution that Swift settled on is, is actually really neat, and it actually kind of mirrors the solution that Objective-C settled on all those years ago. So taking advantage of the fact that, that, that loaders generally slide the entire framework as one, or entire dialab as, as one object. Um, the pointers, the addresses of the pointers, the exact addresses change from run to run. But you know what doesn't change? The relative distance between those pointers. No matter how you slide it, it's always gonna be the same. And so that's what Swift does, is rather than write metadata that has exact pointers that go off and you know, grab you strings and, and, and you know, other kinds of runtime metadata, it just writes down the offset from the base to that member. And it creates what's called a relative direct pointer. And this is a huge win on three fronts. So the linker is happy because there's far less relocations to process. The OS is happy because sliding applications no longer dirties the pages and we can map things into read-only memory. So now we can start sharing things. And you know, we're happy because not all the offsets, you know, we're talking about offsets now, these are, these are deltas. We don't need to store 64-bit addresses anymore. We can store 32-bit offsets. And if we, if we ever discover that we can't store 32-bit offsets, we actually do have a, a, a variant of a relative direct pointer called a relative indirect pointer that can do far jumps if you need to go outside of two gigabytes of, of address. Um, this halves the size of runtime structures on 64-bit platforms. Super cool, for free. So this is, what we, this is what it looks like to implement a relative direct pointer. That's it. You take a relative offset, which is some binary integer type, so in 32 and 16 usually. You grab the raw offset, you take a pointer to yourself, you advance by that offset, and you cast yourself to the pointy type. And lo and behold, we can start reading metadata. <laughs> okay, but we still haven't answered the question, like what metadata are we actually reading? <clears throat> well, following value witness tables, at least for most of the types that we care about here. There's a relative pointer to what's called a context descriptor. And ultimately, the context descriptor is where all the important information resides. So context descriptor captures most anything you could ever wanna know about a type. Um, so the, the leading flags uh, uh, structure describes, like it, it, uh, it's got five bits for uh, which particular uh, context descriptor you're looking at. Uh, so you can, uh, if, if you're actually using the C++ API, you can like cast down to the, to the precise uh, value. Um, it's got like a parent context because we encode not just like types, we encode modules. Um, and you can like get the nesting structure of a type if you need to. Uh, you can get the name of the declaration, obviously. You can get uh, what's called a field descriptor, which points into individual fields, gives you their names. You can uh, grab a field offset vector if you're uh, dealing with classes and structs and tuples. Uh, you can, the generic parameters follow as, as trailing requirements. You can, you can grab the, the, the precise generic signature that, that a type was uh, declared with. Um, and you can, you can grab the constraints associated with that. Uh, there's also the metadata access functions if you need those because uh, it, it's something I, I wish I had time to talk about. Uh, that, that's the way that we implement like associated types. Uh, you can grab all of those. We emit associated types into their own section too. So if you want their names, you can go grab them. Um, it's just right there. It's just there for you to take. And so, if you thought this whole presentation wasn't leading to a sales pitch, <laughs> the culmination of all of this is gonna be released eventually, I hope, uh, as a suite of tools that I'm calling Swift Gestalt. Um, there's a lot of work still left to do uh, to get the library up and running. Uh, there's a lot of cleanup. And I think one of the, the good things that, that is gonna come out of this is that like the, the Swift runtime interface is really not that well documented uh, today. And, and my hope is that like, you know, we're not just gonna be able to like na navel gaze at Swift programs. Like it's cool, but like I really want people to be able to study the runtime and to actually do 
horrible things. <laughs> uh, because if you can do horrible things, like, you know, people can do horrible things with Objective-C. I would love to see people do horrible things with Swift. And you can do horrible things today if you want to. Um, but I also want to enable tools to be written. Like, there's a lot of testing infrastructure that we could build up in Swift uh, just to make sure that the runtime is still stable. And ultimately, like, it would be really nice, like, right now, Swift Gestalt is, like, pure read-only. And Swift is not built for, like, writing protocol descriptions into memory if you wanted to. Uh, but you could. There's nothing stopping you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but like, you know, one of the first things that we were able to do as like a proof of concept is like build class dump tool for Swift. And it doesn't just do classes, it does enums, it does structs, it uses all those nice con context descriptor stuff uh, that we talked about before. Um, and so that's it. Like this, this, is my, this is my big sales pitch. It's like I would really love all of your help when I eventually uh, do release this to the public. Uh, even if you don't like want to contribute something to this, like it would be really nice to go like jump down one of these rabbit holes and like actually help Swift out here with the documentation part. Cause like, it really needs it. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of things I wasn't able to cover uh, and I would love to describe like, you know, I, I just love talking about all these, like the, there's like a, there's a whole spiel about how we resolve like cyclic metadata, uh, dynamic function replacement, protocol witnesses, witness tables, uh, metadata emission strategies, optimization type layouts. There's just all this stuff that I, I it's gone. Um, but that's really the point. So I hope that this brief overview of a large amount of topics inspired you to go learn more. Swift project sources are a great place to start. The community is a great place to start. Uh, uh, forums.swift.org for those that don't know. Um, there's also bugs.swift.org if you're willing to, uh, if you, if you want to go pick something up today. And uh, uh, I'll be here all night and, and I'm generally available on Twitter. So for now, I'll, I'll admonish you in the usual way. Uh, go forth, or break things and fix bugs. Thank you. <laughs>
like the chunk on the this, come on keynote the chunk on the left like it's all just like this is static information at work we have all this aggressive specialization of all these runtime functions because the Swift compiler is able to prove that certain objects always look a certain way, and it's able to optimize their runtime layout because of that. There's like a really, really neat optimization that we can do with enums where we'll like take a look and like see if there's any unused bits in the representation of the values of the associated type, and we will mangle the, the tag bits into those leftover like pointer bits, like this is stuff that you just you can't do in a dynamic language because you can't guarantee the precise like semantics of anything. Like you can be handed a string and you need to go add it to an int. Like, <laughs> yeah. Actually, I have two questions I'm torn between, but I'll ask, I'll ask the probably the more broadly interesting one first. Um, I wonder if, like, in all the work you've been doing on the Swift Gestalt thing that you they're working on, like, uh, clearly there's a lot of potential in all of these runtime methods, and you've been spent a long time thinking about it. I'm curious, like, if you have some sort of like top of mind things that you've thought of in looking at all this as like opportunities to do things you could build on top of Swift. I mean, I don't know if like you know, uh, kind of like uh, in the way that Java has their like annotations and all that, like like things you could add to the language in a more dynamic way. I'm curious what just popped to your mind look, in looking at all this. Uh, one of the really cool things that you can do today with this interface is you can go build a cycle collector. Uh, if you don't like, like, run, like, uh, what is it called, Re retain cycles, um, you can traverse metadata references and you can build a cycle collector. Like, it's, it's not that hard. It, it's a lot of pointer math and it hurts, but it's not that hard. Um, I think that would be a really neat thing to add, like just, just uh, as a kind of like, you know, you can opt into like TSAN and ASAN and things like that. Like we could have a cycle reporting library that you could link in uh, dynamically and there's like as a little checkbox in Xcode and it can like go run off and tell you like not just the object graph debugger, like we can do this with Swift metadata. Um, it would also be really nice to expand the information inside of context descriptors. There's a lot of fix me's inside the context descriptor uh, definitions. Uh, if anybody's interested in adding more metadata, uh, that is always an option. Uh, certainly there's like some impoverished interfaces like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm blanking now, but um, like I said, like you can certainly go grep the header. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple places that at least Slava has, has noted that he would like to fix. I'll do a quick follow-up if I can. Sure. sure. Okay, real quick, sorry, real quick. Uh, just wondering if you have, like, if, um, if you happen to have any particular insight into how any of this uh, runtime, these runtime entry points were used for SwiftUI in particular, and I, one feature in particular, I've th I think I know how they did, they did the rest of it, but one of them I cannot understand is the environment object, because apparently that's supposedly scoped to the view graph somehow, magically. Uh, and I can't see how property wrappers would do that. Um, do you have any, do you, do you happen to know anything about that? Because I don't think any of these are doing I that. saw on Twitter, like I think Joe Groff, whoever said like, like, yeah, it was only no, like no private APIs, no magic, you know, back doors on that. They did it with things that are publicly available, like the runtime stuff, which I imagine got to this, but I'm dying to find out. Yeah, I don't think they're doing anything particularly hairy. Um, Cause the mirror type doesn't seem to have enough in it to actually like do what they're doing. Yeah, I, I actually don't know how that is implemented, okay. um, but I, I don't think it's using any of this. I, uh, there's not really anything here for that. Yeah, yeah, that's a static thing. Yeah, well, I actually said it's done with the runtime, but yeah, like knowing which, anyway. Oh, yeah. We, no, we that, can discuss it after, be, maybe. Huh. That that might be a property of the of the, of the view graph that they build. Like they are able to uh, like use associated object uh, graphs. Maybe I don't know. That might be a way to do it. Well, when, once we can use Swift to salt uh, class dump, we might be able to figure out how that's done. <laughs> I, that is actually another horrible thing that you can do today. There's there's a thing called a tappy um, that LVM is an LVM tool that is used uh, to generate. Have you seen the TBD files that ship with with the SDK? 
like instead of frameworks, like you get like a like appkit.tbd. If you actually go open the thing, it's literally just a text file and it's just full of symbols and there's not it's boring. Um, but like it's super important that that actually maps to something real. Uh, like you can, in theory, you could replace Tappy uh, just using like this. <laughs> okay, let's give it up for Robert.